Welcome back, everyone. Again, my name is Deontay Marquis. I'm a registered nurse and family nurse practitioner. And today we will be resuming our four part presentation on self administration of medication, assistant residents. Um, and this is actually part four. So we are going to begin right where we left off with medication retrieval, storage, and disposal. Okay, and one of the most important things to remember is all residents have the right to privacy and they have the right to make medication decisions. So they can say no, they can say yes, they can say not now. And it is our responsibility and duty to adhere and respect their decision and their right. Okay, so let's get a little bit more in detail on what those rights are. So the rights are, these 12 here to be treated with respect and dignity. We know that we do that with these patients every day um, to be treated as capable of making decisions. Even if we feel like they may not have that ability, if we don't, then we need to let the doctor know, but we cannot decide that they don't have the capability to make decisions regarding their medications. Moving right along, number three, prompt and appropriate medical treatment to choose their healthcare provider or physician to receive only medications prescribed for them, to be given privacy, including administration of medication and treatments, free from neglect and abuse, free of restraints, including chemical restraints. What do we mean by chemical restraints? That's medicine used to subdue or restrain patients. Um, accept medication caregivers to know, expect medication caregivers to know about and promote medication safety. So that's why any medication that we are assisting a resident to self-administer, we need to have some type of knowledge about the medication to be able to advise them properly. Refuse to participate in experimental research, complain without fear of reprimand, choose and refuse treatment prescribed, including medications, okay. So how do we retrieve medications? We need to check, check, check. So that's three checks that we need to Make sure we go through. Um, take the medication in its previously dispensed, properly labeled container from where it was stored, check it, and bring it to the resident, okay? In the presence of the resident, check it again. Read the label, open the container, and remove the prescribed amount of medication from the container and close it. And then check it again, then place an oral dosage in the resident's hand or place the dosage in another container and help the resident by lifting the container to his or her mouth if necessary. And those are our three main checks. Check it when we get it, check it in front of the patient, and then check it right before we actually give it to the patient for them to take it. And now any uh, topical medications applied to the skin, eye, ear, or nose, of course, we're following the instructions written on the medicine container that follow with the doctor's orders. Um, and returning the medication to the proper storage. We wanna make sure that we're checking it again when we return it. Not only checking what we're returning, but checking where we're returning it to, to make sure we're putting it in the correct place so that we're setting up anyone who follows us up for success, okay? We don't want them to make a mistake based on our mistake. And also we're keeping a record of any actions involving the, re involving the resident's medication on our MOR, okay? Um, last, well, up next, uh, storage for residents who self-administer. We covered this previously, but just a reminder lesson here, only self-administered medications may be kept in the resident's room if stored safely and securely. So what does that mean? The medications must be locked when the residents are absent, unless the medication is in a secure place within the room or in some other secure place, which is out of sight of other residents. So we wanna protect other residents from mistakenly thinking that the medications in another resident's room are theirs, taking them, or um, maybe they have some type of med-seeking behavior and they're seeking out medications to harm themselves or they're confused. We need to make sure we're protecting those residents as well who the medication isn't even prescribed for. So if the medication is being kept in a resident's room, please make sure that it's locked away and it's stored away, okay? And prescription and over-the-counter medications for residents also can be centrally located when the following conditions apply. So if the facility is administering the medication 
or the residents request that the facility store the medications or the healthcare provider says that the medications will be hazardous to the resident to keep them in their possession. The resident does not keep it in a secure place. So if they're constantly even leaving the medication out and they're not being responsible with it and it's not being locked when the resident isn't in the room, then that's a cue for us to go ahead and lock that in our central uh, medication storage, wherever that is in the facility you work, okay? Now, centrally stored medications. All medications that are centrally stored are subject to the following restrictions. They should be kept in a locked cabinet, locked cart, or some other type of locked receptacle at all times. The area where they're kept should be at normal temperature, free of any dampness. They should be able to be refrigerated if needed, and that refrigerator should also be locked. Um, they should be kept in their legally dispensed labeled package. So we shouldn't be moving them into uh, other containers and keeping them centrally located. They need, to be, um, they need to be kept in the original package. So weekly pill organizers cannot be centrally stored without a proper label. So if we are gonna label, if we are gonna take them out of the patient's room and they've already been separated into weekly pill organizers, then we must keep them labeled. But in my opinion, the safe bet, if we are keeping all the medications ourselves and um, they are gonna be centrally located, then we should keep them in their uh, original packaging. So more medication storage tips. Um, of course, we know they must be properly closed and sealed so they don't become loose or mixed together. Always keep them labeled. Um, and for example, if a tube of, let's say, uh, fix a dent, denture cream uh, or glue uh, comes in a box for a patient and it's labeled by the pharmacy, the medication must be stored and kept in that labeled box, okay? Um, medications indicated for the eye, ear, nose, and throat should be kept separately in different drawers of the medication cart. That way we're not administering eye drops into the ear or vice versa because we covered that as well, how easy that mistake can be made and how detrimental it can be to our patient's health, okay? Now, refrigerated medications must be kept locked. We talked about this, if they're gonna be centrally located, they must be kept locked. And if they need to be refrigerated, then they need to be centrally located. So that's easy to remember. If it needs to be in the refrigerator, then it needs to be locked. Once open, most insulin should be stored in the refrigerator. This is a common misconception that insulin can be kept room temperature. Most insulins are in the refrigerator. Um, very few can be kept not refrigerated. So please check and make sure with the pharmacy about the storage of an insulin if you are unsure. But most, as we're reviewing here, are to be stored in the refrigerator and should be locked. Medications requiring refrigeration should be stored in the refrigerator at the temperature of 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. So make sure that the temperature of, of the refrigerator at your facility is appropriate. If a multi-use refrigerator is used to store medications outside the secure medication storage area, a separate lock box should be used to store those medications. So it's always making sure that the medications are locked and making sure that they're being stored appropriately. So we already know the appropriate temperature, 36 to 46 degrees. Storage of over-the-counter medications. Remember, we also talked about uh, over-the-counter medications should also be kept in a central facility area um, and not in the patient's reach. An assisted living facility can have a stock supply of over-the-counter medications, such as bottles of ibuprofen, aspirin, Maalox, Tums, common medications that our residents may need. And in the event that the resident requires that medication to be administered, they should not keep these types of medications in their room, even if it's something that they're taking every day, because we should have a stock of these over-the-counter medications for the resident, okay? Um, let's see, a stock supply of any over-the-counter medication may be stored for use by multiple residents in any assisted living facility. So we can dispense this medication to the resident as needed, okay? Because we don't want them abusing or misusing this medication and we wanna keep a fresh document of it. Storage of discontinued medications. So what happens if the doctor stops the medications because it's not working or because the patient doesn't need it for a certain amount of time or maybe the patient reported uh, 
uh, maybe they're taking the medication and they already achieved the therapeutic level uh, and the doctor doesn't want them to take the medication for the next week. So they discontinue it for a week. Um, these medications should be separated entirely from those which are currently being administered to the patient. And this will prevent us from continuing to give a medication that's no longer prescribed as a part of our residence treatment. And when a resident's medication has been discontinued but not expired, it should be returned to the resident if safe or the representative for the resident or the facility can centrally store the medication. Just again, make sure that it is kept separate from those which are still being continued for that patient. Um, let's see, and now when you are storing discontinued medication, make sure you write down the date that it was discontinued and the name of the doctor who discontinued the medication. And even if you wanna go a step further, write the reason why, because the patient may wanna know, or maybe the uh, patient's representative might wanna know. And this was also good information you can pass along to the nurse or healthcare provider who is coming along after you to care for the patient, okay? Um, store each resident's discontinued medication together, for example, in a plastic bag, with the resident's name clearly marked on the bag in the area marked discontinued. Do not alter or write on the medication label, okay? Don't do that. Just put it in a bag that says and write discontinued on the bag. We don't wanna alter the actual label for any reason because we could skew out other information that may be important, especially if the medication is uh, continued at a later time. We can just take it out of the bag, throw away the bag, and then store that discontinued medication with the medications which are still being continued. Now, disposal of a discontinued medication. If discontinued medications are expired or abandoned, they must be disposed of properly. So how do we do that? They must, first, we know that they need to be disposed of within 30 days of the expiration or abandonment. And documentation that the medication has been, has been disposed of should be made in the, pet, in the resident's records, okay? Um, let's see. There are two ways to dispose of medications. It may be taken to a pharmacist or to other waste management agents for disposal. So very simple. I'll just bring it to the pharmacist, say, hey, this medication was discontinued for Mr. Johnson because he is complaining that it causes him nausea. So the doctor discontinued it and we're starting a different medication. Can you dispose of it for me? Simple as that. And then I document it on the MAR and I also document the pharmacist that I gave the medication to, the time. And even um, you can ask the pharmacist if you need to write how much of the medication was left that you gave to them to be disposed. The medication may be destroyed by the administrator or persons designated by the administrator and one witness, okay? Now here is a list of some drugs that you can't flush down the toilet, but we just talked about how to properly dispose of a medication. So please don't flush any medications down the toilet. If you find a medication in your patient's room and it's unlabeled, it's a pill on the floor, pick it up, put it in a bag, bring it to the pharmacy and have them dispose of it, okay? Proper disposal of some medications. Take your medications out of their original containers using gloves. Mix drugs with a little water to make a slurry and then mix with an undesirable substance such as plaster of Paris, cat litter or used coffee grounds. Put that mixture into a disposable lid, such as an empty coffee can, my margarine tub, or into a sealable bag. Remove any personal information, um, covering with a black permanent marker, scratching it off, and place the sealed container in the mixture and empty medication containers in the trash. So this is if you were to uh, trash a medication, dispose of a medication on your own. Let's say the pharmacist wasn't there and you wanted to trash this medication. This is an option for you as well to properly dispose. Most important would be making sure that you mix the medication with some undesirable uh, substance. Um, and then also um, making sure that you remove any 
patient identifiable information because we want to protect our patient's information and that would be a violation of HIPAA if we do not take every precaution to make sure our patient's information is kept safe and out of the hands of others, okay. Um, moving right along here. How to assist with self-administration of medication. We've been talking about this all day, but there are certain specifics that we're going to get into in this next lesson um, to give you guys a bit of a more idea of how to do this. So as you can see here in green, assistance with self-administration of medication for unlicensed ALF staff includes the following oral and topical dosage forms, including skin. Ophthalmic, which refers to eye, otic, which refers to ear, and nasal, which refers to nose forms. Okay. So, what does all that? What are your responsibilities? Well, you have a lot, and that's why we're going through this lesson today, so you can become familiar with your responsibilities, feel more comfortable with assisting your residents, and um, giving you more information on how to perform the responsibilities you have. So taking the medication in its previously dispensed properly labeled container, including an insulin syringe that is pre-filled with a proper dosage by a pharmacist and an insulin pen that is pre-filled by the manufacturer from where it is stored, bringing it to the resident. In the presence of the resident, read the label, open the container, remove the prescribed amount of medication from the container, close the container, Place an oral dosage in the resident's hand or place the dosage in another container and help the resident by lifting the container to their mouth. Applying topical medications, returning the medications to, contain, to the container to proper storage, keeping a record of when the resident received assistance with self-administration. Assisting with use of a nebulizer, using a glucometer, assisting the resident with putting on and taking off anti-embolism stockings assisting with applying and removing oxygen cannula, but not with titrating the oxygen settings. We can only help them put on the cannula, but we can't turn on the oxygen because that is considered titrating and that needs an order and that needs a license for you to be able to titrate the oxygen. Assisting with the use of continuous positive airway pressure, but not with titrating the setting, measuring bottle signs and assisting with colostomy bags. So. Routes of administration for trained unlicensed personnel. So if you're unlicensed, you can assist a resident with, a, with a administration, with self-administration of medications of all these types, oral, buccal, sublingual, topical, transdermal, ophthalmic, otic, nasal, and inhalant. I think all of these we talked about in our lesson so far, except for buccal, which is a tablet dissolved in the cheek or of the mouth. So you just put the medication on the side of the patient's teeth, right up against their cheek and allow it to dissolve, okay? Routes of administration only for nurses or licensed personnel, rectum, vaginal, subcutaneous, intramuscular, intravenous, nasogastric, subcutaneous. We cannot administer insulin, okay? We cannot. Universal precautions this is an approach for infection control. According to the concept of universal precautions, all human blood and certain body fluids are treated as if known to be infected for HIV. Okay, so even if the patient doesn't have HIV listed in their medical history, according to universal precautions, we treat all body fluids as if we know that they have HIV. And this is to make sure we're keeping the patient safe and of course ourselves safe. Hand washing, always wash hands after urination, bowel movements, changing sanitary products, any contact with any type of blood fluid, bodily fluid. Wash hands before preparing or eating, after covering your mouth and nose when coughing or sneezing, and most importantly, before and after using gloves. Well, hand washing is the most easy, is the easiest and most important way to prevent infection. Uh, and hopefully you have been taught how to properly wash your hands before and after handling medications, okay? So here we are, how to assist with oral, solid, and liquid medications. This is something you will be doing very frequently, okay? And most of you already know how to do this, have some idea, um, so won't spend too much time here, but 
Of course, we're going to identify the patient first. We're going to remove the appropriate amount of medication. We're going to check, check, check. So our three checks, we checked for the medication appropriateness three times, and then we assist the patient. Uh, make sure that when you go into the resident's room, you have all the supplies you need, water, juice, cups, spoon, a, spoon, a pill splitter, before assisting with the administration of medications. Um, and it's usually best to take a full glass of water because sometimes the patients need more water to wash the medication down in the middle of taking the pill. So you never know how much water they'll need. And in my experience, it has happened where the patient has the medication stuck in their throat. I, bought a, I brought what I thought was enough fluid for them to drink and I had to hurry and get some more. So take it from my advice, my mistake, make sure you have more than enough water available. Um, only break, cut, or split score tablets or crush oral solid tablets and capsules as prescribed. Okay, so if the patient says the pill is too big, if it's not already scored or indicated that this medication can be split, then please do not split that medication because you could be breaking what they call an enteric coating, which is meant to have the medication uh, release its effects in a slow sustained release or extended release. And if we cut the medication in half with a pill splitter, because the patient says that the medication is too big, then we are essentially changing the pharmacokinetics or the effects of the medication being administered. Okay. Um, and of course, assist with the medication only when you assure the nine rights of medication administration are being carried out. Right dose, right drug, right route, right time, right reason, right response, the right to refuse, and the right record and document. And always observe the resident swallow the medication. Always check expiration dates before assisting the patient with medications. Okay. Um, let's see. So we'll talk a, just a second about breaking, cutting, or splitting score tablets. Okay. Only score tablets can be broken by an unlicensed personnel or staff. A medication label may state, take half a tablet. However, you may only break tablets and capsules that are scored. And these scores, you'll see them already, they're done by the manufacturer. A score tablet has, an embedded, has been embedded for easier and an even breakage and assures the correct dosage of a medication is divided to be administered. You can use a pill cutter or other devices but just make sure when you are using a pill cutter that that pill cutter is clean. You don't want the residue from any other medication to interact with this new medication you are cutting to administer, administer to the patient, okay? Crushing tablets. Can the medication be crushed? This is a great question, a common question. You may crush a medication only when the medication label specifically directs you to do so. Some medications are not meant to be crushed. In general, medications that are sustained release or controlled release or extended release, just as I said, they have an enteric coating which cannot be crushed. Can the capsule be opened and mixed with food? Most crushed tablets or empty capsules may be mixed with certain foods, including applesauce, pudding, for administration. Medications cannot be hidden in foods for residents who are refusing them, okay? And how to crush or split a medication, that's self-explanatory. We know how to do that. Medications that should not be crushed or chewed, we talked about that, those medications, um, which are not indicated that they can be crushed, which means that they aren't already scored by the uh, manufacturer. Oral liquid medications, they're poured, measured, and swallowed. It sounds very simple. It is very simple. Make sure that we shake the medication well before we pour it into a container or cup. And make sure that when you're pouring it into a container or cup to measure out the dosage, so if it's in a medicine cup, that's your eye level with the medication cup so you can make sure it's being as accurate as possible, okay? Do not use silverware spoons for giving medications. They are not all the same size. A silverware teaspoon could be as small as a half teaspoon or as large as two teaspoons. So there's a lot of variability in the amount of medication we're giving a patient if we're using spoons. So to be exact and accurate, please use a medication cup and make sure that liquid medications are being stored properly because they are most importantly, they're uh, most commonly need to be refrigerated 
And here, this gentleman, you see he's doing it correctly. He poured the medication and he got down to eye level to make sure that he is giving the correct dose. Okay, and we know how to pour. Here are some conversions. Do not use CC, use ML. A half a teaspoon is 2.5 mLs. One teaspoon, five mLs. One tablespoon, 15, okay? And then you can do the math from there. Make sure you are getting eye level and using a medicine cup when administering uh, oral medications, okay? How to assist with topical creams and lotions? Well, we know. Wash our hands, identify the resident, go through our nine rights of medication administration, triple check before and apply the medication to the areas indicated on the doctor's orders, not where the patient says the medication should go. And the same goes for transdermal patches, okay? Where the, um, the only thing to remember with uh, transdermal patches is this medication goes through the skin. So make sure when you open the package and remove the patch that you not only make sure your skin and your fingertips does not touch the uh, back of the medication when the, the back of the patch, when you have peeled the, uh, the back off, but also make sure you date and time that uh, patch so that the staff following you, we set them up for success and they know when to remove the medication. Um, topical eye medications, make sure that you're storing it properly. If it needs to be refrigerated, then refrigerate it. Make sure we're washing our hands because we may need to uh, assist the resident with opening their eyes. Um, make sure that they're lying down. Clean the eye with warm water if you need to. Remove any crust or drainage or discharge. Wipe the eye clean. Make sure you're going from the inside to the out if you're wiping clean, um, shake the medication well, and make sure the patient's in a comfortable position before you administer the eye drop, okay? Explain what you're doing to the residents so that they can assist you. And make sure that you are wearing a glove on your hand if you are uh, assisting the patient with pulling their lower eyelid down to form a pouch for the uh, eye drops to sit in, as you see here. This person does not have a glove on, but they are pulling the, eye, the lower eyelid down to create a pouch to administer the eye drops. And you ask the resident to look up at the ceiling, okay? Oh, uh, make sure if, if additional drops of the same or different medication are required in the same eye, wait three to 10 minutes. Okay, I've had patients, sometimes they need antibiotic drops in their eyes, and then they also need eye drops for itching or irritation. Make sure you're waiting for the uh, medication solution to be absolved by the eye before administering more, okay? Ear medications, okay, ear medications. If an ear medication requires refrigeration, store is, make sure it's in a locked refrigerator. Make sure we're shaking it well. Don't forget the nine rights of medication, okay? Straighten the ear canal by gently pulling the ear lobe up and back, up and back, okay? And then you're dropping the medication in their ear. Nose medications, that's pretty self-explanatory. Hands are clean, shaking the bottle appropriately, making sure the resident's in a comfortable position with their head up, so that you can, uh, and the nostrils are facing up and that way you can dispense the medication into the nose, into the nasal passageway and it can work as effectively, okay? Let's see, I really want to touch on, uh, one more area before we conclude. Here it is, one of the most common medications that you will be administering to your residents that is insulin pins, insulin pins. They come in all different shapes and sizes and colors and doses. But at the end of the day, the anatomy of the insulin pin remains the same. There is a cap, a needle, an inner needle and a needle inside of that, okay? A protective seal, which covers it, a rubber seal on top here. And this is the insulin res reservoir. This is where the medicine is with the numbers on the side so as to see how much is left. 
there's a dose window, and this is where we dial in the dose that we want to administer or help the resident administer. Please remember when you're administering insulin to residents that you are rotating the injection sites, okay? Um, make sure that you only use sites on the front of the body for self-injection because the that way the resident can see and do it properly um, and we're not making any mistakes. Move the site of each injection at least one and a half inches away from the last injection site, but try to use the same general area at the same time of the day. So if you're using the abdomen before lunch, make sure that you're using the abdomen before lunch. If you're using the arm in the morning, make sure you're using the arm in the morning, every morning. If the resident isn't already in this regimen, educate them why this is important. And if you aren't too comfortable in educating them why, then have the nurse do so for you. But the reason is, it's just the absorption of the medication by the body. It takes different times to be absorbed by, at different parts of the body. So we wanna make sure that we are uh, giving it the same time, the same day. So the blood sugar is regulated similarly every day. So assisting the resident with insulin pins, of course, we're always going to follow, you're always going to follow your facility's injection control policy, which is pretty much standard. So it's washing your hands before administration, triple checking the medication label. And uh, you want to make sure that the resident can understands how to administer this medication, which most do. You want to make sure that they prime the tip of the needle. So you attach the tip, you dial in a dose, and then you just push it through. So you waste a little bit of the medication, but that's just priming the needle, getting rid of any air or blank space inside the needle, filling it with medication. So that when we dial in, that we're giving the resident exactly um, what is being prescribed. So we suggest priming the needle with two units. So you dial in two units, you push the tip of the pin, the plunger, you prime the needle. Double check the dose, dial the prescribed dose, you give the needle to the patient, you, they clean the area that the, uh, they're going to inject the insulin into themselves with. Um, and most manufacturers recommend that they leave the pin or needle in their skin for at least 10 seconds after injecting. So it allows for the full dose of insulin to, uh, to be administered and absorbed. And instruct the resident to release the button and quickly remove the needle from the skin. And the great thing about insulin pins is it's easy for the residents to use. It's a lot safer, um, decreases the chances that they will stick themselves by mistake and then make sure that they are giving themselves the accurate amount. So it minimizes the chance for mistakes. Okay, um, and that was the most important topic that I wanted to discuss you guys with. There is a little bit more information and if you are interested, um, please refer to your lesson review guidebook. But insulin pens, again, that is the most common. Um, and of course, if you're unsure, you can always refer to the information pamphlet included by the manufacturer inside the insulin pen, okay? or you can always ask the nurse or ask the pharmacist to help assist you and educate you on the insulin pen. Um, because they all, they all are very different, but at the end of the day, they all do the same thing. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for being with me today. And if you also listen to or watch the last three videos, I wanna thank you. Uh, hope that you were able to learn a lot. It's a lot of information, I know, but this is things we know that's going to help us be better healthcare providers for our patients, for our residents, wherever the facility is that you are working. On behalf of my ALF, myassistedlivingfacility.com, we thank you. Hope that you enjoyed this presentation. And as always, we will see you again next time. My name is Deontay, and I'll see you again.